The road stretched ahead, endless and inviting. It was one of those perfect summer days when the sun hangs high and the asphalt shimmers with heat. I had taken a week off work to drive across the country, just me, my car, and the open road. Freedom at its finest. I was somewhere in the Midwest, maybe Kansas or Nebraska. It didn't really matter. The towns all blended together after a while. I had a destination in mind, but no rush to get there. It was all about the journey, you know. About mid-afternoon, I noticed the fuel gauge dipping toward empty. I pulled off the highway at the next exit, a small sign promising a gas station and diner. The kind of place where you could get a full meal for under 10 bucks. The station was old, probably from the 60s, but well kept. A single pump, a worn out sign, and a diner with a flickering neon sign that read, Eats. I pulled up to the pump and started filling the tank. A man emerged from the diner, wiping his hands on a greasy rag. He looked to be in his late 40s, with a pot belly and a friendly, albeit tired, smile. Passing through? He asked, shading his eyes from the sun. Yeah, I replied. Just needed to refuel. Well, you came to the right place. Best pie in three counties. He chuckled, his voice carrying the hint of a local accent. I nodded more out of politeness than interest. I wasn't planning to stick around, but something about his demeanor put me at ease. He seemed like one of those genuinely nice people you read about but never meet. After filling up, I went inside to pay. The air conditioning was a welcome relief from the sweltering heat. The diner smelled like coffee and fried food, the kind of smell that reminded me of road trips with my parents when I was a kid. I decided to take the man up on his offer and ordered a slice of apple pie. He served it himself, sliding into the booth across from me as I ate. Name's Hank, he said, extending his hand. Jack, I replied, shaking it. We chatted for a while. Hank told me about his life, the town, and the diner. He had inherited it from his father and had been running it ever since. It was the kind of small town story that felt like it could belong to anyone. It was late afternoon by the time I finished the pie. I thanked Hank and made my way back to the car. I had planned to drive another few hours before stopping for the night, but something about the quietness of the town, the simplicity of it, made me want to stay. I found a small motel a few miles down the road. It was one of those places where you park right outside your room. The clerk, an elderly woman with a kind smile, handed me a key without asking too many questions. The room was basic but clean. I took a quick shower and lay down, intending to rest for a bit before heading out to explore. But exhaustion from the long drive caught up with me, and I drifted off to sleep. I woke up to darkness. The clock on the nightstand read 2.13 a.m. My mouth was dry, and I remembered I hadn't had anything to drink since the diner. I grabbed my keys and headed to the vending machine outside the office. The night was eerily silent. Not a single car on the road, not even the hum of distant traffic, just the chirping of crickets and the occasional rustle of leaves. I fed a dollar into the machine and pressed the button for a bottle of water. That's when I heard it, a soft, almost imperceptible sound behind me. I turned quickly but saw nothing, just the empty parking lot and the dark outline of my car. I shook off the unease, grabbed the bottle, and headed back to my room. As I inserted the key into the lock, I heard it again, this time, closer. A shuffling sound like someone dragging their feet across gravel. My heart started to race. I turned the key, but the door wouldn't budge. Panic set in as I fumbled with it, finally pushing it open and slamming it shut behind me. I stood there breathing heavily, trying to convince myself it was nothing. Just my imagination. I double-checked the lock and wedged a chair under the handle for good measure. I lay back down, but sleep wouldn't come. Every creak, every whisper of wind outside had me on edge. I felt trapped, suffocated by the silence. Morning couldn't come fast enough. As soon as the first light crept through the curtains, I was up and out the door. I checked out, mumbling a hasty thanks to the clerk and hit the road but the unease from the night before clung to me. I kept checking the rearview mirror, 
half expecting to see someone following me. The day passed in a blur. Miles of empty road broken only by the occasional truck stop. I tried to shake off the feeling, but it gnawed at me, a constant, dull anxiety. By late afternoon, I needed a break. I pulled off the highway into another small town, similar to the one from the day before. I found a diner and went inside, hoping a meal would help clear my head. The place was empty except for the waitress and a couple in the corner booth. I took a seat at the counter and ordered a coffee. As I sipped it, I felt a presence beside me. I looked up to see a man sitting down, his face obscured by the brim of his hat. He looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. Long drive? He asked, not looking up. Yeah, I replied cautiously. He nodded, taking a sip of his own coffee. Funny thing about these roads, you never know who you'll run into. Something about his tone sent a chill down my spine. I looked at him more closely, and my heart skipped a beat. It was Hank, but different. There was a coldness in his eyes that hadn't been there before. I forced a smile. Yeah, I guess so. He turned to face me and for a moment we just stared at each other. Then he smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. Safe travels, Jack. I watched as he got up and left the diner, his footsteps echoing in the empty space. My hands were shaking as I paid and hurried back to my car. I didn't stop driving until I crossed the state line. Only then did I pull over at a rest stop, trying to make sense of what had happened. My mind raced with questions. How did he find me? What did he want? The rest of the trip passed in a haze of paranoia. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of someone lurking just out of sight. I stuck to busy highways, avoided small towns and slept in well-lit, crowded motels. When I finally reached my destination, I felt a huge sense of relief. I checked into a hotel in the city, hoping the crowds would provide some safety. But that night as I lay in bed I heard it again. The soft, shuffling sound outside my door. My heart pounded in my chest as I crept to the peephole and looked out. There was no one there. Just the empty hallway. I double-checked the lock, then sat down back against the door and waited. Morning came and with it a sense of resolve. I couldn't keep running. I had to confront this. I called the police, told them everything. They took my statement, but there wasn't much they could do without more information. Days turned into weeks, and the fear gradually faded. I returned to work, resumed my normal life. But I never forgot the look in Hank's eyes or the sound of his footsteps. I still take road trips, but I'm more careful now. I stick to well-traveled routes, avoid lonely diners, and always, always lock my doors. Because you never know who you'll run into on the road, or who might be following you. Months passed. I found myself slipping back into a routine. The fear that had once gripped me was now just a distant memory, a bad dream that I could rationalize away in the daylight. Life returned to normal. It was a Friday night when I decided to go out with some friends. We hit a few bars, had some drinks, and by midnight, I was feeling the pleasant buzz of alcohol. We parted ways, and I decided to walk home. It wasn't far, and the night air felt good. The streets were quiet, most people already asleep or settled into their Friday night plans. I walked briskly, enjoying the solitude. But as I turned down a particularly dark alley, I heard it again. The unmistakable shuffle of feet behind me. I froze heart pounding in my chest. I glanced over my shoulder but saw nothing, just shadows dancing under the flickering streetlights. I told myself it was nothing, just my imagination playing tricks on me. I picked up my pace but the sound followed growing louder, closer. Panic surged through me. I broke into a run, not daring to look back. My apartment building was just a few blocks away. If I could make it there, I'd be safe. I reached the front door, fumbling with my keys, my hands shaking uncontrollably. I finally got the door open and slammed it shut behind me, leaning against it as I tried to catch my breath. The hallway was empty, eerily silent. I made my way to my apartment, the feeling of unease growing stronger with each step. I locked the door behind me and collapsed onto the couch, 
my mind racing. That night, sleep eluded me. Every sound, every creak, sent me into a state of hyper-awareness. I kept checking the locks, peering through the people, convinced that at any moment Hank would appear. Days turned into weeks, and the fear that had once faded was back with a vengeance. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of someone lurking just out of sight. I became paranoid, isolating myself from friends and family, afraid to leave my apartment. One night, I was jolted awake by a loud banging on my door. My heart raced as I grabbed a baseball bat from under my bed and approached the door cautiously. Who is it? I called out, my voice trembling. Police, open up, a voice replied. Relief washed over me as I opened the door to find two officers standing there. They asked if I was Jack and I nodded, confused and scared. We need to talk to you about a man named Hank, one of them said. I invited them in, my mind racing. They explained that Hank had been found dead in his diner, a victim of a robbery gone wrong. My blood ran cold as they showed me a photo of him, lying lifeless on the floor. But that wasn't all. They had found my name and address written on a piece of paper in his pocket. They wanted to know if I had any idea why. I told them everything, from the diner to the night at the motel, the feeling of being followed. They listened, nodding, but their expressions were unreadable. After they left, I sat in my apartment trying to make sense of it all. If Hank was dead, who had been following me? Had it all been in my head? The weeks that followed were a blur. I tried to move on, to convince myself that it was over. But the paranoia never left me. Every shadow, every sound, kept me on edge. One evening, as I was leaving work, I saw a familiar face in the crowd. My heart stopped. It was Hank, or someone who looked just like him. He was watching me, a cold smile on his lips. I hurried to my car, not daring to look back. The drive home was a blur of fear and confusion. When I finally got inside, I locked the door and called the police, but by the time they arrived, the man was gone. The sightings continued. I saw him everywhere outside my apartment, at the grocery store, even at work. I tried to rationalize it to tell myself it was just a coincidence, but deep down I knew better. The police didn't believe me. They said it was just my imagination, that I was seeing things because of the trauma. But I knew what I saw. I knew he was out there watching, waiting. I stopped taking road trips. The open road, once a symbol of freedom, now felt like a trap. I couldn't escape the feeling of being hunted, of someone lurking just out of sight. To this day, I don't know who he was or why he targeted me, but I do know this. There are no coincidences. The world is full of people like Hank, hiding behind friendly smiles, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. So if you're ever on a lonely road or in a quiet town and you feel that unease, that sense of being watched, trust your instincts. Lock your doors, keep your guard up, and never, ever let your guard down. Because you never know who might be following you, or who might be waiting for the perfect moment to strike.